I had many reasons to be furious at my ex-husband. He abandoned me with a text message. He married another woman while we were still married. He spread lies about me and destroyed my character to others in our life. But of all of those things that he did, what made me the most angry was the financial abuse and betrayal. Because of everything that he did, that one had the most lasting impact. When it comes to anger after financial abuse, it's often aimed in three different directions. Some of it obviously is aimed at your ex. You know, they're obviously the ones that did this to you. And they're somebody that you trusted. There's also anger turned inwards because you're berating yourself for not knowing, for not looking, not asking enough questions. And then finally, there's anger towards the system because if you're dealing with the legal system with this at all, you're going to find there are not much help at all. And when it comes to those three different parties, well, you can't force your ex to apologize or in many cases even pay you back. You can't change the system. But what you can do is change some of your mindset around this and find some ways to release that anger. The first step in releasing the anger after financial betrayal or abuse is accepting the unfairness. I remember being so furious that I was the one that had to clean up his mess. I literally would scream, slamming my fist down on my desk, that it wasn't fair, that he was skating off in this what looked like great life, and I was nickel and diming it, trying to pay it back. And it's not fair. There's not one thing fair about any of this. And that just is. So accept it because there's nothing else you can do with it. And once you accept it, then you can start to change how you respond to it. A second way to help release your anger is through gratitude notes. And I know that sounds a little bit crazy. Here's how that worked for me. I had some payment plans set up to pay off the debt that my ex left me with, um, over $50,000 on my teacher's salary. (laughs) And every month when I made those clicks to send off that payment, I also wrote a little note of gratitude. And it was gratitude that was somehow related to that payment. So it was things like, I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to build this life that I have now. I'm so grateful that even with this debt, I have been able to maintain a reasonable standard of living. I'm grateful that I have a career that is allowing me to pay back this debt. And those little notes didn't erase the anger, but it did help to shift my mindset a little bit each month so that it wasn't simply focused on having to pay this money that just made me feel sick, quite frankly. A third strategy, even while you're working within this strict budget, make sure that you save some money for yourself. And I recommend doing this with what I like to call scheduled smiles. So what that means is plan something, you know, every week, every month that you look forward to, and then make sure to put it on your calendar to schedule it. And these can be small, you know, it could be as quick and inexpensive as a cup of coffee at your favorite coffee shop, or it could be something a little bit bigger if your finances allow. It doesn't have to be big, but make sure you put it down. Make sure that you just take that moment to recognize that even while you're dealing with this debt that you were left with, that you're still honoring yourself. Fourth strategy is a hard one, and that's to eliminate your expectations. 
I had attorneys promise me that they would be able to get some of that money back, that the judge was going to order him to pay, and that I would be reimbursed. Well, they were partially right. The judge did order him to pay, and he made exactly one payment. One. And then when I called my attorney's office to find out the next steps, it was, well, if you pay us this money, then we'll be happy to file contempt of court and all of that nonsense. And I soon realized that I was going to be paying more money to try to get back some of what he owed me. And he certainly didn't seem like he was going to pay. So I made the very difficult decision to walk away. And that was very, very difficult to let go of any expectation that I would ever be reimbursed. A fifth strategy for releasing the anger is to explore your legal options carefully. Part of the anger comes from the fact that you're feeling powerless. You didn't cause this and it was all done to you. And now you're having to deal with it. And when you explore your options, it gives you some sense of control, even if you ultimately decide not to pursue them. So make sure you understand within the civil court system what your options are. Make sure you understand any tax implications. You might want to look into the Innocent Spouse Relief Program through the IRS. Consider bankruptcy if that's appropriate for you. Just look at all of those things with an open mind and see what's available to you. Just knowing what your options are helps you feel a little bit better. A sixth strategy is to track your progress. And I cannot overemphasize how important this is. I know for me that $50,000 felt insurmountable. It was more than my annual salary at the time. And I could not imagine breaking that down and making it disappear. But I did. And it was literally one penny, one dollar at a time. And track that progress. You know, it's small, and so we don't often see it. So find a tangible way, whatever way works for you, to notice those little steps that you're taking, and then celebrate them. Seventh strategy, Find a balance between self-compassion and tough love. Compassion for yourself for the mistakes that you've made. You know, you're probably in hindsight recognizing some things that you did or didn't do that helped to get you into this situation. Forgive yourself from that. But now you know better. And now that you know better, you need to do better. That's where the tough love comes in. You cannot hide from this. You cannot wish it away. You cannot bury your head in the sand and hope that somehow this is going to fix itself or that somebody else is going to rescue you. No, this is on you, but you got it. The eighth strategy is actually less money focused um, and just more general focused. And that's to balance your openness and your protection. Some of what happens after betrayal of any kind, and for me at least, especially with the financial betrayal, is that you don't want to feel vulnerable again. And so because of that, it's really easy to build up these really high walls and try to keep other people at arm's length. But the problem with with doing that is it becomes a habit just like anything else. And you're not going to have a fulfilling, happy, relationship-rich life if you're always keeping others away. And so make that an intentional practice to work at staying open, at least when it's safe. The ninth strategy is to focus on the lessons. And I know that's hard, but it's also so, so important. And I find, at least for me, that 
if I can focus on what I've learned from the situation, it's a lot easier for me to be kinder to myself with the mistakes that I did make. Because at least then I can say, yeah, I screwed that up. But here's what I learned from it. And now here's what I'm doing so that it doesn't happen again. And then finally, the 10th strategy, which isn't really a strategy. It's more of, I think, an overarching mindset that I know really helped me. And it was this. During the entire five years that I was paying off the debt, I kept telling myself, this, this is my down payment on a better life. It's a purchase that I never wanted. It's a purchase I never agreed to, but it comes with a no return policy. So it's mine. So it's up to me to make the best of it. It's up to me to make sure that this down payment on a better life is not wasted. 